Hello and welcome to Hydrate. This season we'll be reading and discussing Liu Shishin's The Dark Forest, book number two of the Remembrance of Earth Past series. This is season three, episode three, The Spell, where we'll be discussing all of part two. In season one, we talked about the three-body problem, and the hosts have varying degrees and levels of knowledge of this book and the rest of the series. My name is Dan, and I've read the entire series. This is Tim, and I've uh, only read up to this week's reading. This is Amin. I, too, have only read up to this week's reading, and I also co-host the Rehydrate spoiler cast with Talia and Dan. So if you have read the series or don't care about spoilers, you should also check out those episodes. Uh, I have one item for follow-up, and uh, it's not really in, in the follow-up, but just more of a correction to the reading list that was on the website. So initially on the reading list, I had said uh, this episode will cover chapters one to one, and I just forgot that there's three chapters. You know, they're not numbered. This whole book is weird about how we had to split it up because of the the structure that he, he wrote it in. Just so everyone's clear, this episode will cover the entirety of part two of the dark forest so uh, chapters one two and three the reading list has been updated on the website but if in case you are following along and haven't read the entirety of part two um, just be warned no out of curiosity does the third book continue in this structure i don't want to you know like, no, no. Okay. The, the, what's strange is like, like the, the third book chapters. there's like there's like a million chapter a million small chapters <laughs> oh, okay so I don't know. Like maybe it's experimenting with different formats or whatever, but yeah, it's it's very strange. But I mean, I prefer like a million small chapters to three gigantic ones. Sure. Is, has he ever uh, discussed like why he structured it this way or like why like he went for this super chapter uh like format for the second book? Maybe. I, I haven't I haven't read any interviews or heard why he went that way, but you may have. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's very strange. It's a uh, a little bit hard to read sometimes. I think this this I mean this section is longer overall, but like it, because it's broken into three distinct sections, maybe it's you can like kind of break it up a little bit easier that way yourself when you're reading it. Sure, I thought this I thought this was an easier read than the previous one um, personally, but uh, yeah, even though it was longer, yeah, because there's like three distinct you know time periods that you're reading through, you can kind of mentally <laughs> yeah break it up. And speaking of, let's dive into the summary. So. This will be a little bit longer one because this is a bigger section of reading and a lot of stuff happens in these chapters. So um, start off with uh, wall facer Frederick Tyler, who is visited by his wall breaker almost immediately when we open up. And his wall breaker is able to figure out his entire secret plan. His plan in the English translation, and more on that later, uh, consists of recruiting ETO members to help double cross and destroy the Earth Space Force. He then would make a peace offering to the Trisolarians with large quantities of frozen waters from the uh, Europa and Ceres to help them rehydrate and other uses for clean water. Furthermore, his plan was that the ETO ships, as they're approaching the Trisolarian fleet, would then be triple-crossed, and then he would then take over the control of the, the fleet and uh, detonate the bombs at very close range to the Trisolarian fleet. Fully defeated by his plans being exposed, he visits both G at his estate and shortly after commits suicide at the lake near his house. Boaji well, continues his life of luxury in the ensuing years, and he has married Zhong Yan and had a daughter named Shasha. Shortly after being, being visited by Tyler, he finds that Zhong Yan and Shasha have been taken away from him by the PDC, a plan that's been in, uh, in motion ever since he originally found Zhong Yan to match Boaji's description. They realize that he is the wall breaker that Trisolaris fears the most in the repeated attempts to kill him and wants him to refocus his efforts as to figure out why. While strung through his estate, he eventually wanders onto a frozen lake, and as he falls through, has an epiphany. That's the nature of the universe. And he remarks to himself, Wall facer of the Wachi, I am your wall breaker. He leaves his estate to work far underground for security, and gets to work on what he calls a spell that has to do with broadcasting the location of a star about 50 light years away. However, the ETO's latest plan to get Luaji appears to finally work. They have developed a genetically engineered virus that gets everyone around him mildly sick, but is deadly specifically to Lo Ji. He turns to the last resort after there's no medical solution to hibernate and hope for a future cure. We jump then to year 12 of the crisis era, where we follow Zhang Beihai, who seeks out Ding Yi, who has made a breakthrough in fusion drives, and he asked him if he can hide his research because he's worried that the research into more conventional technology won't produce the interstellar ships that are ultimately lead to humanity's defeat. 
Chong takes matters into his own hands, purchases meteorites, crashes them into bullets, and assassinates the lead scientists in space by shooting them with the meteorite bullets to make it look like a meteorite shower. This effectively moves all research into the quote-unquote non-media propelled drive research that he feels is the best chance for future success. The Sofans and the ETO observe this, but they feel the research and triumphalism are ultimately losing efforts and have no risk to their lord. Zhang Baihai then also goes into hibernation to help the future Space Force. Next, we jump into Crisis Era Year 20, and we meet up with Heinz and Diaz, who both awake from hibernation. Heinz finds that his wife Keiko has continued the research on faster computers, and by utilizing a neural network of sorts, they are able to increase efficiency and speed by about 10,000 times. In their continued research, they come across a method which they named the mental seal, in which they can implant an idea. There is broad skepticism since the plan is tantamount to mind control. However, they develop a compromise. They will only implant the idea of faith and victory if a member of the military happens to volunteer. And after a slow start, there's a steady stream of volunteers, after which both Heinz and Keiko decide to go into hibernation. Shortly before losing consciousness, Keiko also has an epiphany, but is not able to alert anybody before she falls into the deep sleep of hibernation. Finally, Wallfacer Diaz emerges from hibernation to find that they've been able to develop stellar hydrogen bombs, bombs that are about 350 megatons of explosive power. He requests the test in the underground tunnel of Mercury since it's too dangerous to do in Earth's atmosphere or in the, in the Earth. After the PTC debates, they eventually allow it after it is described as the most secure fallback location against the Trisolarian fleet. After the successful test on Mercury, Diaz is also confronted by his wallbreaker. His wallbreaker also details Diaz's diabolical plan to destroy the entire solar system by detonating enough bombs on Mercury to make it fall into the sun, causing a chain reaction destroying the planets up to Jupiter or further, thereby making the solar system uninhabitable by the Trisolarians. However, it's destroying the Earth and all the people on it as a consequence. The PDC wants to charge Diaz with the yet-to-be-created law against the extinction of life on Earth. However, Diaz tells them that he has rigged the dead man switch to himself, and should anything happen to him, that a bomb will detonate under New York City. His only demand is that he should be allowed to return home, to which they re reluctantly agree. Upon returning to his home, he is not greeted with open arms, but rather with a shower of rocks as his people ultimately stone him to death. A lot of stuff happened in these chapters, and so, like I said, a lot of reading, but I want to give you guys a chance to you know, start discussing it. I really like this uh, section. There was, uh, again, a lot, a lot that happened here, but I was a bit worried, you know, from the first section that this whole kind of like book would just kind of be like kind of spinning its wheels and like following the progression of the various wall facers and like at various skips in the, the timeline. And I mean, this does to a little bit, but I think it kind of nicely compressed everything with them into one chapter. And I was uh, like kind of like happy that this kind of like kind of moved to the way it did um there's like a lot of cool there's a lot of cool sciencey stuff in here um you know, yeah and there's a lot of you know cool concepts here yeah i'm just kind of glad he covered the ground that he did in this one chapter i mean it was big um you know it was you know a, a bit difficult to get through just because of the super chapter structure right but, um yeah and he, and he also sets up you know a couple you know like cool mysteries um and I think that's you know often been the thing that's kind of like gotten me you know compelled in reading compelled to continue reading these books um you know like from the first uh from the first book it was you know the thing with uh you know Wang's like you know the numbers appearing on his eyes and like the what's going on here and you know the first part of this book didn't really set up a whole lot of that other than like introducing the wall facers and but here you know like I, I mean, there's two central kind of mysteries here that I think are compelling one is uh Luigi's, you know, plan and how it comes, you know, even though it kind of comes to fruition, or he has this like epiphany in a little bit of a cliched way, you know, like has like a sudden falls through the ice and then just has this like sudden eureka moment. Like it's, it becomes a little more clear, I guess, why they think he's like, you know, why the Trisolarans think he's dangerous and apparently it ties into like what UNG like told him um, hmm. and how that all ties together and what his plan is, like how this like actually like executes, like who knows, um, or why it's important, or how it might be something that works um, is, you know, unclear. But it's a good, you know, it's it's good speculation. Yeah, it's a good hook. 
And also the the little uh, like aside of Keiko when she has her little right before she goes, gets frozen has right. you know, her eyes widen and like well oh, oh no what did, what have we done type thing so yeah um, you know that's interesting as well to me what that is you know is a good hook yeah how, how about you I mean what did you think of these chapters I I liked the first and last chapter I didn't I guess I didn't exactly remember what the context was of the, of the middle part with meteorite bullets I thought it was I thought it was neat, but I didn't quite, maybe we'll find out. I didn't quite see where that fit into the overall plot. Um, I Just like Tim, I like that the Wallfacer stories are, are progressing. The fact that there's only half as many now is hopefully means that the story is going to be getting tighter. And I assume, I, I know I know you said that, he, that Tyler commits suicide, but it was kind of quote unquote off screen. So I was wondering if it actually happened or if it was a fake out or what. But no, it's not a fake out. They, they they talk about it afterwards too. Like the yeah, I think in, in the PTC meetings they talk about how he dies. So like yeah, it's there's no uh, th- th- there's no trickery there. Okay, it's, it, it would feel pretty cheap if like he wasn't dead. Yeah, that's you know? that's what I thought too. <laughs> so yeah, um, but yeah, I, I I liked I liked these chapters, and I thought the one thing the one thing I thought was the best about these chapters was the way Diaz's death was. I don't know. It was like three sentences maybe how they how they just kind of wrapped it up so so quickly mm. without being gruesome and whatever it was very it was very matter of fact and i thought that was i thought that was an appropriate ending as well yeah had it been like george r, r. martin it would have gone for like, yes, you know, exactly. a chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so so going back to uh john Bay high a little bit yeah like it can be confusing of like what is happening but like at the end of the day like his whole thing along the his his whole story so far has been that like he feels the only way that their humans can can defeat the Trisolarians or be successful in their efforts is to be more forward thinking in their um, in the progression in science, even despite the Sofan lock, right? So he tries to like talk to Dingy in the beginning and say like, oh, you know, can you actually not tell people like your progression and like that way? Because if if people think that we're making progression and like these older means of um, using like chemical propulsion and that kind of stuff, like then they'll, they'll kind of abandon the higher tech just for the stuff that they know. And there's also like this old guard. You know, they, they call them like the old aerospace, you know, engineers who like just use the technology they know of. And John Wei is like really against uh, that. And, you know, he's a strong uh, triumphalist and says like, this is the only way we can kind of progress forward. And so it gets to the point where he actually like assassinates the people who are responsible. That's the only, it's the only means that he can think of to um, actually stop the progression of kind of the older technology. And so, yeah, he figures it a way to, you know, to kind of cover it up. Cause like, obviously he's like a big, you know, he's, he's an important person in the military. So if that came out, it wouldn't look good for him. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. He, he comes up with a plan to a- assassinate them in space. And then uh, they even mentioned after that, like, well, because the scientists died, like now, like in, in when they get into year twenty, or maybe it wasn't year twenty, but anyway, like they talk about after that event happens, like then the uh, the research into the non media propulsion drives becomes more prevalent, and uh, and I think in year twenty they talk about how like it's still in the early stages, like they, it fails a lot and it kind of blows up in the in the atmosphere, but like they're working on it and not just like relying on old technology. So that's that's sort of his arc so far. Yeah, he's um I think he's being set up, you know, he's kind of this wild card uh <laughs> character, you know, amid, amidst all these like and yeah, until this moment, you know, until this assassination and all that, I never, you know, had, had him pegged as quite a, a fanatic as far as this. But um I mean the plan, you know, and this is a kind of a contrivance for the story, seems a little far fetched that it would actually like cause the effect that uh that he wanted. Um yeah. but you know, this whole story is based a little bit on just these few great figures guiding humanity it seems dubious to me and you know as far as realistically that oh you take out these couple guys that like they're that means like it's it's gonna this whole project or this whole train of technological progress is going to shut down because like these three people are gone yeah yeah like that's just not how science works or you know um, right or big large organizations that are developing you know technology yeah. yeah so i don't know to you know i mean it's it's kind of a consequence of you have to have character in, in like science fiction and all that you kind of have to have like these sort of great men type characters that are uh yeah you know, guiding like scientific progress or so and that really isn't how it would work in the real in real life 
Yeah. To, to be fair, he, he does say he wasn't sure it's going to work. Like this is his best chance, right? Like sure. this, yeah. this is my, this is my shot. And like, and maybe it won't even work. He even talks about like, well, maybe like I won't get him this time. I'll have to think of a different way to get him next time. The decision-making process is kind of done off screen. Like where like they do shift over to the new technology. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, does that make, does that kind of clarify his, his, his arc a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. That helps. Yeah, I mean, it was confusing to me too. Like the first time, the first time, yeah, time I read it, like, yeah, like why, especially cause like, I think like you guys, like I hadn't, his character isn't super interesting in the first couple of chapters. Cause he's just like, yeah, military guy doing military stuff. And now it's like, whoa, that guy is what going, you know, killing people in space now. <laughs> what's, what's going on? Uh, it doesn't seem like in his character. Right. But I, I guess if you think about it as kind of a whole arc, I think it does make sense. It, it's not that much of a leap that he becomes that, that fanatical level where he would actually kill people to achieve his goals. Yeah. That's why I think he's being set up. I mean, uh, and I obviously could be wrong, but this is just my speculation at this point, but in the future, you know, when the battle happens or whatever, you know, I think he's going to be this kind of like wild card character that might be the one who's reckless action or fanaticism like spoils the plan or or he mm -hmm. could be you know someone who was maybe he was right and you know he he'll be the catalyst for victory or something like that but uh yeah i don't know where they're going with where he's going with his character do you feel like that's like a uh, an interesting mystery at the same level as uh Luigi spell or or the other some of the other stuff no not quite i mean mm -hmm. um you know, but uh, just interested to see where you know his character goes, uh, you know, when they wake up and what role he has to play. How, how did you feel about the um, the introduction of the wall breakers? Like, do, were, were you surprised it happened so soon? I mean, in the book, they're surprised that it happened because, like, well, Jesus says, "Whoa, already <laughs> they already came." So, like, was it surprising to you that they they came so soon? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Like, I I wasn't yeah. Like, I had you know, given my uh, trepidation about the previous chapter, I had kind of settled in my expectations kind of settled for the rest of this book would be following the wall you know the wall facers and like f also following like wall breaker machinations in the background yeah and yeah it, it i was surprised to see it uh you know like happen that quickly i think what i'd like to see a little bit more of the the machinations of the wall breakers like they do we do get a little bit you know in the three body world of them uh kind of planning uh, yeah, assigning wall breakers to each one uh, and even like later on when they talk about how they're going to get to Lord G once he goes uh, underground, uh, that stuff is interesting. So I, I think that's maybe an area that, that could have been explored more. I, I, I agree with that. I, I thought, I think the wall breakers just showing up is interesting, but I feel like flipping back and forth might have built a little bit more, more tension. I guess when they just show up, it's, it, it is a surprise and it is oh, what's going to happen, but I don't know, I suppose... I suppose it works either way. He's the author, so I guess he did it the way he wanted to. But I, I agree. Yeah. I think it would have been interesting to, to hear more of their planning as well. I think that first one especially is supposed to be like a really big surprise. Like it's supposed to be like, whoa, they, 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 they came up with a plan already. <laughs> yeah, I think it was kind of clever. But they kind of sort of bookended this whole chapter with, uh, you know, yeah. wall, wall breakers uh, showing up. I mean, this being kind of a high-minded science fiction novel, I always kind of expected that the more high-minded, unconventional, you know, um, wall facer plans will kind of be the ones to win out, you know, um, in mm. the end. So, like, you know, the two, you know, wall facers that were kind of going for the more kind of like blunt, you know, uh, kind of strong-armed um, plans. Like, I kind of expected them to not not taken out of action so quickly. But to not be the ones whose plan actually saves the day or so, or maybe at the end of the day, expected it to be, you know, more of a composite of all four plans or something like that. But um, mm. yeah. And, yeah. and also, I think it's interesting that the the two the two wall facers that Tim and I thought were had the least the least viable or least interesting plans were the first two who are no longer with us. Yeah, I think he was you know, setting that up, like, you know, setting that up from the start. Although I did kind of like, like there is kind of a, you know, a, a bit of an aside here. There is a bit kind of uh, like a bit of like stereotyping. I feel like with both the like the PDC and the wall facers, and that you have the like, s you know, South American strongman, as well <laughs> as um, as well as I also noticed that when um, we haven't gotten to Heinz yet, but you know, when he uh, gives his like plan, you know, basically mind control plan that it was like the German. PDC office, you know, like member that was like the only one who was like not immediately like like dismissive of it. Oh yeah. You know? 
I don't know. If the, I don't know if you guys, you know, like notice that, but it, it. I feel like there's a there is a bit of like stereotyping going on with you know the representatives of various countries here. The, the U.S. want you know is talk you know calling him a dirty terrorist. Uh, right. You know, <laughs> yeah, Diaz a dirty terrorist. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think yeah, the especially like Diaz like definitely falls into like yeah that South South American you know, like dictator and like. Just super evil, you know, Hugo Chavez kind of style of evil and like, you know, what he would have done if, uh, you know, he had access to all the resources in the world. That said, I wouldn't have guessed that his plan would be to destroy the universe or the, the solar system. But <laughs> well, I mean, when if the plan was to just, you know, as a last resort, you know, if all other plans fail, we're just going to threaten the Trisolarans with blowing everything up. Like, right. you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I was mildly like it was a pretty cool plan. I was mildly sympathetic, you know, somewhat sympathetic to it. And as like, well, I'm going to just take it upon myself to like formulate the like last ditch effort, hail mary plan, and to say, hey, you guys don't say it. we can just we can just literally blow up this you know solar system if all other plans fail. But you know, when he kind of went into the well of actually uh, threatening to blow up New York. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, then he gets a bit more uh, evil there. You remind me of, like Bane or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, up to until then, I was kind of like sympathetic to it in, in in the fact that like, okay, well, I'm going to assume that these other three, you know, wall facers are going to like formulate like a master plan to, you know, just def- defeat them at their own game. And then like, mm. I'm going to take it upon myself to be the one face the ugly scenario of like no other plan is uh, viable or if they all fail, then like, here's the last ditch effort. And it may be ugly, but it's our last, you know, our, our last chance is to just threaten them with blowing them all up. Yeah, I always took it as he was, it's more of like a threat. Like the Trislerans can see him doing that. So they, they would have to divert course and not come. That That's the majority. Of his, but like they have to believe that he's crazy enough to actually like do it. And I think he is, right? Yeah. Like I think he would have done it if they, they had not diverted course or just did, did start to attack. Um, you know, sort of the, the mutually assured destruction, you know, of like Cold War era kind of politics. I mean, again, if you have four plans going, you might as well have one of them <laughs> be the nuke everything one. <laughs> right. <laughs> so one thing I did want to bring up, which I, I alluded to in the in the summary, uh, I'm going to put this in the the show notes. So there's a warning for our listeners here. So I'm going to be referencing a book that another book that Leo Shishin wrote called Ball Lightning. So if you don't want any of that spoiled for you, um, you can just skip through this part. Fair warning to everybody about that. But in one of my conversations with one of our, our listeners and people I had an interview with uh, named Frank, he actually uh, had brought this to my attention originally that Tyler's plan in the original Chinese is totally different from the, the what happened in the English translation. So in the English translation, you know, he has this double cross, triple cross thing where he's going to you know, use the ETO to blow up the Trisolarans. But the plan that he actually comes up with in the, in the original in the original Chinese uses a uh, technology or I don't know, a concept called ball lightning. And so I haven't read ball lightning, but like Frank was able to uh, give like a kind of little summary of like how it works. And so basically what it is, is like, yeah, big lightning thing that, I don't know, it, it interacts with like uh, stuff at the subatomic level. And basically like it can disintegrate stuff in what's called like the, the normal world. And then, it, but it doesn't destroy them. It moves them into what's called a quantum state. Sort of like uh, if you've watched like Star Trek, like there's like, there's like one episode where they go out of phase. That's kind of how I took it. Uh, like Jordy is like is like out of phase from the rest of the world, and they can kind of interact with like the real world, but not really. Anyway, so Tyler's plan originally was that he was going to use ball lightning to use against the space force, which moved them all into the quantum state. And then by being in the quantum state, they would not be able to be killed by the Trisolarans. And hope Tyler's hope was that the fighters would still be loyal enough, even though they know they're in a quantum state. And then once you're in the quantum state, like you eventually, it kind of decays to, to just like to, to going out of existence. But like in the interim period, they would then be basically invincible to attack the Trisolarans. Um, and the Trisolarans, because they're in the quantum state, couldn't attack them back. The, the theories of why Liu Shishin did the chain, or why, maybe, maybe he didn't do it, but maybe Joel Martinson did it or whoever, uh, is because Ball of Lightning, when this book, when Dark Force was published in English, wasn't out in English yet. So people wouldn't have had that background because they have a whole book about like how this works. And again, that's a big spoiler to Ball of Lightning. So hopefully you've got to this point, you don't care. But 
yeah, I mean, I think it's it's interesting how it was changed, and the, it's also interesting that in the full translation that the Trisolarians they they also don't care about his plan. They're like, yeah, the I'm gonna read the translation says that the wallbreaker turned back to him, ex- exuding once more the tenderness of an executioner. Nothing, Mister Tyler, be the Earth fleet at the collapse uh, state or the quantum state, be the human space fighters alive or in quantum specters, the Lord does not care. So that kind of implies that like the Trisolarians can deal with that kind of state or they just, you know, they're arrogant enough where they think they can overpower whatever we throw at them. Like, how, how do you guys think about that plan? I can see why it was changed. Um, hmm. And again, yeah, we don't know where, you know, who changed it. Um, but considering like that sounds too high tech for what, uh, humans yeah. are capable of considering you know a big you know uh feel factor in all of this is the technological limitation on uh humans um the interesting thing is actually like they mentioned ball lightning and in the in three body problem like when they're when they're planning um operation Gujung and like trying to think of the different ways that they can um actually attack the freighter ball lightning is actually one of the the proposals that's put forward so it's a, it's a thing in this world um, sure yeah, and like, but the, the the they were worried that it was gonna destroy. You know, the collateral damage would be the data they're trying to get after on the on the ship. Were they even talking about quantum states or putting, you know, ball lightning putting something in a quantum state that can be, you know, restored later? Like, again, like that feels like a little too high tech oh. considering the parameters that he'd laid down for you know human capability. So I mean, I kind of like the change that he made here in that it is a bit more conventional in that we're gonna. We're just yeah. going to drag big icebergs over them and off, you know, give them an offering of water, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. like, like it seems, it seems more, you know, realistic within the bounds that he's set. You know? Yeah. Um, and, so. and just to be clear, like Tyler's plan, like was to put him in the quantum state and just have them eventually die. Like he had no plans of getting them back. It was more, yeah, and, and it's kind of the same way here. Like he's having the ETO destroy the, you know, double cross the space force here. And then they, you know, because it only be like a small portion of the space force that will be ETO sympathizers. Um, so he's sacrificing, you know, however many people, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people who are going to be piloting these these mosquito ships. Um, and so similarly here, he's he's saying, I'm going to destroy the entire space force. But because they'll be loyal enough to the cause of the Earth, even if they know they're going to die when they're in the quantum state, they'll still attack the Trisolarians. Sure. Yeah, the whole kamikaze aspect, you know, yeah. um, still holds true here. It's just the scientific mechanism by which you know he's a. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's, the, yeah. The kamikaze like, thing is a you know like uh, not a good. I'm not going to say a good idea, but it's uh, again, if you're talking about uh you know a technologically like gated you know human uh, response like yeah yeah just willing to being you know being willing to just sacrifice a ton of your you know uh, your own people. Seems right. like this, you know the sort of thing you might have to resort to. Yeah, because ball of lightning is like kind of it's 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 not anywhere close to reality right now. Like like Tyler's plan like could work, right? Like given the fact that we have these swarm of fighters and like we can make bigger bombs, right? Like that's not outside the realm of possibility. So we can mine series in in Europa for ice, right? But like ball of lightning doesn't it's not a real thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, and you know they've continuously talked about the you know so fun lock. Um, right, so, right. you know, what, does that require physics beyond what we can do? And, uh, and actually, as we're on that, um, remind me again, maybe I'm forgetting what the actual, like, mechanism by which the Sophons are, like, locking. Is it because they're, they're just inhibiting, like, particle accelerators? Is that's why yeah. we can't get any further? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, like, that, that's why they're able to progress, like, in technology, like, in smaller means that they have right now, but they're not sure. able to, like, do, like, really what they call fundamental research because, yeah, particle accelerators and stuff at, like, more of, like, a, a atomic level is the SOFONs can just block all the research that goes into there, so they're sure. not able to make, like, really fundamental progress. Sure. They're, like, literally physically blocking the particles being accelerated in the... Yeah, yeah. And so that's what it calls out, like the scientists go crazy and three body problem. <laughs> and so they're just continuing that. And so, yeah, no, all like the, you know, people like Dingyi, like they have to like just to go towards what was it called? The, like they had like the theoretical and like the practical application of science. And so they had to go more practical. Uh, how, how about you, I mean, how did you think of, of Tyler's uh, original plan here? I, I think it would have made for, I think it would have made the reading much more dense. I yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it would be 
Um, I, I think it's, again, it's so, it's so theoretical to me that I guess it sounds, ball of lightning sounds cool, but I don't, I don't know necessarily that it would have changed my opinion of, of this chapter or these three chapters. Yeah, I, I agree. I think like the, if you're really into like Leo Sishin in general and like have read ball lightning and, and know all these concepts, then it, it would be cool to see that callback. Right. Cause like you'd already known about that stuff and you, have, you don't, you wouldn't have to get like the big download of all the data and like how it works and that kind of stuff and kind of wrap your head around it. Um, but given the fact that it wasn't even in English at this point, like it's it would be almost impossible to kind of convey that. Yeah, and and now I'm wondering what other, maybe much more minor things, but were were altered between the publication in Chinese and the uh, English translation publications because this this seems like a pretty big one, and I understand why they did yeah. this, but I wonder how many other less major changes there are. So yeah, I mean, like talking talking to Frank and some other people, like the this seems to be the biggest change for sure. Um, he did mention one interesting thing um, in the original publication of Three Body Problem. They actually start um, the book with Wang Miao instead of the Cultural Revolution and kind of uh, switch those chapters around. I'm not sure why, um, and I don't even remember if they changed that later on and to into later publishing. But in the original publication, like that's that was the other big change. But to me, like the biggest changes were not even changes, but like kind of like just stuff that's lost in translation. You know, there's a lot of like. Chinese kind of phrases that uh, make more sense to a Chinese reading audience. It is more, uh, I guess, like when you think in a different language, right? Like you'll kind of grasp these concepts uh, and people, and then like, uh, Talia and other people have mentioned like, um, like the Chinese has like these four word phrases and they, they kind of reuse them um, frequently, uh, but they're translated in English. They don't, they're not, they don't resonate as much. Yeah. I don't know if we had discussed this before, but um, I think we had briefly, but um, you know, do Chinese readers of this like have different ideas of his prose or, you know, opinions of his prose? Because, you know, we've always talked about it as being you know a little dry, or at least um, in, in English, you know, it comes off a, a, a bit dry and his characters don't necessarily pop or, you know, aren't really like the primary focus. But do like Chinese readers have like a different impression of his prose and does it come off better in Chinese? I am not sure. So if you are a person who's written in Chinese, please let us know. And we will read it on the next show. I mean, uh, from what Talia has told us, uh, the death, the third book, Death's End, is like really the most popular book, and it's really skyrocketed the series in 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 Chinese um, popularity. Yeah. But that's that's as much as I know. I I don't, I don't know specifically about his his writing, but I know like in general, like uh, Li Xin is super popular in, in China. Yeah, I mean, I know like uh, something is always, you know, lost in translation or there's always that risk there. Like, for example, like I, you know, read and, you know, I like the the Witcher novels and, you know, that was, uh, that started as a big uh, book series in Eastern Europe, you know, written by a Polish author. And, you know, mm. that's like how it got popular first is extremely popular there. And then, you know, it's made into games and, you know, translated into English and all that. And now it's, you know, a big property here, but it's always been a bit of a, criticism of the English translations, or at least Polish readers, um, you know, have always said that he uses, you know, turns of phrase and, you know, idiosyncrasies of the Polish language really well, doesn't quite come across in English. So, you know, mm. I, I've definitely, you know, from what I've read, it can come off a little stilted sometimes, and there's been a couple different um, translators of it. Yeah, I mean, it's gotten really popular regardless, but uh, there's always yeah. been a bit of a gap in, you know, how well his the prose reads between English and Polish. Um, so I guess let's move on to the third wall facer that we have talked about, which is Heinz and his plan for his original plan and his wife's plan was to kind of enhance the human brain by having like this these computers scan the scan the entire brain like really fast and uh, you know at regular at a high rate so they can kind of study the brain in kind of real time. But during their their research, they're able to figure out like oh actually by this kind of happenstance. By increasing the power during one phrase, they're able to kind of implant that as an idea and cause a mental seal. And so that's originally uh, manifested by a person kind of reacting to a statement that says water is toxic, but then at the same time, like they increase the power. And so he did think that the water is toxic. And then, and I think kind of an unrealistic scenario, like Heinz actually does the same experiment uh, and says, well, I'll try it. We'll see. I'll see if it works on me. And it does work on him. And he becomes deathly afraid to uh, to drink water and took a while for him to kind of overcome that. The part I thought was really interesting 
Heinz, when he figures this out, he goes to one of the generals in the military and talks to him about it. And like, he thinks that like, he'll be really into it. But the, the military guy is like, uh, that's actually like mind control. And that's really against like the spirit of like our, you know, what, what we want to instill in our troops. And I guess like, to me, like the military is always like, it, it, they, they would seem to be like on that kind of page, you know, in this kind of scenario. Um, so it's interesting that the military people are the first people to, to speak up against the unintended consequences here of controlling people as automatons. And then, of course, like the PTC also has all their same uh, same concerns about it. I, I was surprised the military was so conservative and not in a political sense, but was so reluctant to explore this further. Because, again, if they're was that line that civilization's main goal is its own survival and if this is if this is part of survival then you'd think that they would be open to at least the conversation but they seem to dismiss it outright yeah. pretty quickly yeah i'll admit i didn't pick up on the military being like the first one like i, I kind of for, forgot it was that, that it was the military who you know kind of first rejected it or like rejected it outright you know as far as the general like the, you know the pdc just kind of you know balking at it um you know all that is like extremely understandable to me uh totally yeah <laughs> but uh yeah you're, i mean you are correct that like you would you know kind of assume that like the, the the one section of humanity that would uh you know be more amenable to it would be you know a military or like would immediately be able to see its military application you know in order to yeah you know, increase morale in troops or you know get them all on the same page and that right so much of part you know part of like military training is sort of breaking down sense of self and more loyalty and dedication to your units or whatever right um, maybe he's just being overly charitable to you know how he wants to portray the military yeah i mean like i think especially with all the focus that they've been putting on the book so far about like uh, you know jung bay high being against um defeatism and like really like thinking about like ways to to make sure that that is not the case and like people really do have a faith in victory you know, in the, in the future that uh, I think, I think, <clears throat> I think it was Wesa here who just like dismisses out of hand. So yes, yeah, it's, it's it, and, and Wesa is the, is the defeatist, right? Like he, he knows that like, or he, he believes that like we're going to be defeated. So yeah, it's pretty interesting that like he is like, not for the, this, this mental seal technology. Um, but it seems like eventually like the, they come up with a pretty interesting compromise where saying, yeah, like you can get the metal seal if you uh, volunteer to do it, and you can only be part of the military to volunteer to do it. So that was a pretty interesting compromise. And the I thought like the parts where they talk about like the really strict restrictions and like the actual methodology to implant the metal seal is like very rigid and you know can't be changed. It was was all pretty pretty interesting to me. Yeah, I liked that part. It, it seemed to be a you know a somewhat uh, realistic way to you know portray how humanity might react to this and you know like this is this is this is also something you could like write a whole science fiction series just based around this you know like if this was like available to and you had the uh like the option to sort of like change your brain um, right. in ways that you think might be you know like you know, maybe you just want to like zap this part of you know like this inhibited part of your brain you think this has always been holding you back or you want to forget this part of your life or think that if you beam this part of your brain you'd be a more talented musician or something like that you know like there's a lot you could spin out from this concept and then all the all the ways that can go wrong right right like you know yeah. like not only like personally but in society right and maybe, maybe that's what uh keiko uh realized before she became frozen in carbonite but uh <laughs> yeah and i like the the, the passive you know that he does have a little bit of fun with it with like the guy who you know, came in and the first guy who comes in and says he just wants to forget that his wife is cheating on him or something like that. Um, right. <laughs> He's like, get the hell out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these, you know, like little moments of like levity are pretty rare in this kid and that he's not a super humorous, you know, writer, but they're kind of, yeah. You know, like he does, uh, like I could see that uh, in a TV series or something like that, they, that being, you know, that's maybe a little more like, deftly written or written for a more broad audience that like stuff like that might be played up a bit yeah i mean i think this is interesting like you know i hope this this is just sort of like the first part of his plan like it's hard to you know see how just getting the military like on board with, like that you know i could see that how that like might you know bolster our chances in the future but it, you know it can't be the be you know be all end all of his plan but uh, i mean do you think he even has a plan besides i mean like his original plan was just to 
uh, and to increase the human brain capacity for they even talk about it what it was it uh because he, he, there's like a difference between intelligence and like mental ability or something you know and he's he's like oh like you understand like the difference right but like um do you think that his plan even goes above that like do you think he even has a secret plan i mean he could he's got this pretty powerful uh you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> weapon at his disposal to manipulate people if he chose to somehow find no means you know like break the you know you know break the regulations on it or now that he's introduced this into the world by the time he wakes up how will this have been like perverted you know so like i definitely see like potential if you know here for him to end up you know in, in a way almost an even bigger villain than the other two a villain like how, how do you think it'd become a villain well given what this technology can do you know does he use it to does he use it to just mind control people into his you know <laughs> bidding and is that part of his mm -hmm. master plan is to turn people into his slaves essentially you know i know that's a little far-fetched but i mean I, you know like that's uh and he's more far no than blowing up the solar system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, in, but it is a little more like we, you know, nefarious in its own, you know, in, in yeah. its own way. Um, and, and I think Heinz hasn't been set up to be that kind of person either, right? Like Diaz, you can tell, like he's kind of that person who, yeah, it's not, it's not outside of his character, but Heinz is, you know, the more refined person and like more intellectual. Um, I mean, so yeah, it would be outside I mean, of his character. This is something very dangerous and scary that he's introduced, and you know, as yeah. far as just from a human free will perspective, maybe not necessarily him being a villain, but as like a Frankenstein where his monster gets out of control or something like that. Yeah. Did how about you? I mean, did you like these the the this plan, or did did you find this plan interesting? No, I did not find this no? plan very interesting. <laughs> I uh, of the three, like I know this, I know. Heinz is, is the one that's still alive, but this one was the most, uh, is the slowest one, I guess. And I, mm. I'm interested to see what happens when Keiko's epiphany is revealed and, and when she wakes up from her hibernation. But no, I was, I was not super into, into this, the Heinz part of this. That's fair. But it's also interesting that you thought his, like his plan had the best chance of, or like when we talked about the three plans, like you had said, like you would have gone with his plan, but that's by, by default. Well, I think the way it was described is, uh, I think it's a little more it's more meticulously explained so maybe that's why it's less interesting now um mm. but but again i i think i am looking forward to what happens when they wake up from hibernation and, and see where things are but no this this part was one of the parts that i actually started skimming so i was like oh this, <laughs> this is gonna be a lot of the same stuff over and over I mean, the whole brain imaging part and then like using that as sort of like an analog, you know, like, you know, this network of neurons um, as an analog for like actual the galaxy or space or something like that was kind of neat. I'm not sure if this um, part was really, you know, Lucius Shin just trying to have another like, you know, scientific flourish, essentially, mm -hmm. obviously likes to wax about, uh, you know, kind of high minded scientific concepts and uh all this so maybe he just couldn't resist putting in a passage about uh neuroscience in the brain and uh, <laughs> you know, uh yeah i thought like the computer part like where he talks about like million like what like billions or trillions of chips all in you know all like wired up together and like and he was saying like oh it's going to take like the entirety of all the chips ever produced by earth and kate goes like well probably more yeah, <laughs> like he was trying to have like his Carl Sagan moment of like you know trying to impart the fastness of space or the billions and billions of you know <laughs> what that means, um, you know, in, right. like a sense of like majesty and magnitude. Any any theories of what Keiko might have realized? I'm just going to assume that given how dangerous that this is, that yeah, she had some sort of epiphany vision of how this could go horribly wrong. Um, that's about as specific as I can make it, but I'm interested to see. Sure. I don't think they put much clues in there to actually figure it out, to be fair. So, I mean, the, I think like just kind of like your own ideas is, is pretty interesting to think about. I, I know, I mean, I think we already told you, so I'm not going to ask you. But, uh, right. <laughs> um, so I guess move on to the fourth wall facer here, which is uh, Lua Ji and his spell. So uh, they're kind of, I mean, he's kind of cagey about like, you know, to both the reader and to the PDC about what the spell is actually doing. But he does actually like talk about uh, you know what he, he what I mean like what he's doing practically like he's they talk a lot about like how you can identify a star and the way you do that is by kind of doing it in, in the position you know relative to other stars and then uh, talking about broadcasting that out um, I guess 
did, did that all make sense to you? Do you think that this, I mean, like, how can this even work as a plan? Like, what, what effect is it going to have by doing that? Yeah, I don't know. I think that's the central mystery. Yeah. Here. Yeah, I, I understood um, conceptually why they were doing this. I didn't understand why it had to be 50 light years away. You'd think that if they want to test this and have time to adjust their plan, that you could have found something that was less than 50 light years away. But that was that was my only my only question is why wait a hundred years to see whether or not this actually did something. The interesting thing is like he found a star that was closer and he said that was too close. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't he, understand yeah. why, why it had to be 50 more. Yeah. I almost think in a way that like Ushishin here is trying to like give the reader the experience of being like a wall breaker in that like the easiest, you know, and most transparent ones ended up being the ones to, you know, that were most quickly like broken Mm. In this, um, uh, Luigi's plan is supposed to be as opaque to you as you know, and and difficult to crack as a wall breaker would be trying. Right. Be uh, you know, like trying to discern at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's opaque to him, right, for a while. <laughs> so maybe we just need to go walk on some ice, and then you know, we'll have a, our own epiphany, like, oh, Luigi, that's why he's doing. It. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to throw out any ideas as to what this is all going to coalesce into. Like maybe, like, oh, if we can, like crack building some sort of like map of the universe or something like that or some sort you know maybe we could all both you know us and the trisolarians come to the understanding that there's other civilizations out there and that we don't have to be fighting over our one little tiny corner of it i don't know you know mm. something like that I don't yeah i mean like uh you know jong yen does you know does talk about like you know can't we just live in harmony so maybe that's part of it right like maybe that influences thinking yeah and speaking of speaking of her like I mean, it's not great that they that the PDC uses her and you know, basically just a pawn in the, in the game. I guess the fact that she knew all along that you know this was part of the plan to like eventually take her away is something, but like I don't know, still not great. <laughs> I, I wish like she had a little more agency in, in the decision here. Yeah, you know, maybe she did, but they 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 kind of go on a lot about you know how she really did love him and all that kind of stuff. So it's like all that stuff wasn't made up, but. Yeah, yeah, she was. She she kind of knew all along that this was eventually going to be that that she was going to be using this role. I, I don't think it justifies the other chapters kind of cringiness to me, but it's not as bad, I guess. Yeah, and that in that they just didn't like there is a reason behind it, and that they just didn't pluck some uh, you know young woman out of you know just to be <laughs> his life partner. Yeah, I mean that does give her a bit more agency. Yeah, and that there's a little bit of like a Truman Show thing going on here. Um, mm even though like she was part of this plan that spending five years with somebody and having a child with them, you know, like it's, it seems realistically that even though this, you know, this, this relationship was artificially forged that, you know, something real could come out of it. I mean, the creepiness just kind of more comes into Lu, Lu Ji himself and like his, yeah, just kind of like preferences, I guess, and, like how childlike she is and this or that, you know, <laughs> yeah. just a little bit creepy definitely yeah i i was gonna say i i agree i I don't think i don't think the ends necessarily justified the means i think there could have been a different way to get him to start actually thinking about this and working on it because it, it like once that happened he you know he got on the right path or whatever but it seemed more like just him falling through the ice is what took it it wasn't necessarily wasn't necessarily that hey he's really excited to get back to his whatever wife and kid right yeah like he I mean he he had nothing else to do now it's like well i guess i gotta think about it, which is i guess their plan right I, I, as, as i'm reading this series like over you know multiple times like i'm trying to like figure out like better ways to spin this because this is you know like i guess like i mentioned before like this whole jong yen the arc is my least favorite part of the whole series so i'm trying to think of ways to make it better and i, I you know maybe it's like the you know but by the fact that she was kind of in on it all along doesn't make it a little bit better but i wish she'd be a little little more active you know not just like uh not just a pawn for the pdc to kind of force uh logi to do something yeah or if if it gave a bit more insight into her you know you had a couple chapters with her or her them kind of discussing the plan with her right they they very they very much could have made her yeah more of a central character like have us headed a start you know uh starting chapter or early chapter her discussing and you're not sure what the plan is yet but having a discussion with you know a pdc 
official or something like that, uh, like establishing her as an agent in this. Yeah, definitely. Like that's something I could see maybe actually even being changed for like a TV show. You know, if you're going to spend, you know, 10 episodes or something on this, you know, on this book, just like stretch it out a bit and to have a bit more of a well-rounded uh, ensemble of characters or so. I could see that, like that being a positive change. Yeah, I mean, I think like just in the culture in general, right? Like the maybe if they made the show 10 years ago and they had a kind of like a woman with no agency, like that probably would have, you know, people would have made noise about it. But like now it's like a different climate, right? So now people are more looking for that kind of stuff and looking for this, this things. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, right? But I think like in, in today's climate, like they're not going to be able to like have this kind of woman with no agency. So I think they're going to have to do something to make her character a bit more, have more agency, I guess. is like the sure. only really good yeah. word um to describe it i think there's a lot of surprise element here you know like she goes away and then you realize oh she was an agent the whole time like so if they had if they had had her talking to the pdc ahead of time like maybe that would have kind of set it up in your mind it wouldn't be as surprising sure. um but there's other ways that she you know i i, I the parts that were interesting to me was like that she starts to kind of help him understand you know her perspective on uh, on like painting and how, the, how to look at the world a little bit differently and you know but, but with like the 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 blank spaces on the pages and that kind of stuff and then you know talking about how you know maybe you know maybe we don't have to fight like maybe we can like live together like he could have used that to kind of develop his plan a little bit more in, in conjunction with her no, I agree. and maybe they'll do that <laughs> like that would be a more you know if, if they kind of set her up as an agent from the start and like like that would be an interesting like if they if they had richer interactions between them that kind of primed him to be the kind of person to like actually come up with a you know a good plan um, right. or, and, or maybe she and, eventually becomes the wall facer right like you know it's like oh sure. John Yan was the wall facer all along sure or has you know or or, or strongly contributes you know yeah. to that you know you could have you know character moments in a tv show or something like that you know in London that uh like I think more firmly established that and that would be a better like you shouldn't just write around having like these surprise moments like i think you know mm. okay maybe you wouldn't have this like shock moment of like oh she was in on it the whole long but that's you know you got enough of those you don't really need to it's, it's not worth like issuing a more interesting direction which would be maybe more to establish a more realistic relationship between them yeah i have to i had to assume that like this this part like her character specifically will be like maybe the biggest change between the books and the tv shows I would just say in general, like my thoughts around like this, this part of like some of the coolest stuff and the, the whole series happens in this. I mean, like there's lots of other cool stuff that's going to happen for sure. But like, I know like the first half of this book was like pretty dry, right? You know, there's a lot of kind of going over concepts, but like this part specifically, like lots of cool stuff happens. Like we get, we get introduced to the wall breakers. We have John B. High Space assassination. We have Ray Diaz's plan to blow up the solar system. <laughs> we have the dead man switch part. Like all this stuff is like, in my mind, like, thinking about the book like there's a big iconic moments and i think it just gets better from here hopefully you guys are i mean it sounds like you guys are excited to to read the rest of the book and the rest of the series too so one one section that we've kind of haven't talked about for a while is is how would this be a tv show and i think these three chapters i think these three chapters would be very talky and and some of these concepts i think they'd have to have some type of visuals or whatever but i thought as as I was going back to that original concept that we started way back in season one, but but I do think that this book, despite its time shifts and all those kinds of things, would you know they might have to do something fancy with makeup and wardrobe and all those things to show the passage of time, but I do think that these feel like they would, you know, I think Tim mentioned they they have to be some modifications and some characters would have to be combined or whatever, but these feel like they would be good episodes and and maybe this we crammed all this into one episode but this might actually have to be two episodes or they spread it out over a longer period of time and intercut it some more but i I, for sure like this is not yeah this is not one hour of tv no it is not (laughs) no no the the budget's the budget's gonna go up for these uh chapters uh yeah i mean in my mind like when when i'm when i'm thinking of like these things like i'm thinking of like the wall breaker coming to to Tyler or Diaz, right? And then like inner space of that is like actual like visualizations of their plan. Like this is what actually like the destruction of the solar system would look like, you know, as he's talking about it. Um, and so like there's really a lot of like budget for that. And like also, you know, Tyler's plan of, uh, of, of, of uh, his, you know, his, his double and triple cross plan would they be showing that on the screen, right? Not just like talking about it. So it wouldn't be just like the wall, the wall breaker coming in there and just talking about it for an hour. It'd be like actually showing like what the plan would, the theoretical plan would be. Yeah, a lot of good, uh, like, Lost or Game of Thrones, like, whoa moments, you know. 
yeah. of the show here. I, th- I, I do want to see the, the space assassination episode. But, Definitely. Uh, yeah, and, like and, be fun. In, in like the spoiler that. cast, we 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 had compared it to like a James Bond movie, and I think that's that's pretty apt, right? Like <laughs> you have like uh, this James Bond kind of character in space, like with his gun from like five kilometers away yeah. shooting guys. <laughs> yeah, with, yeah, and then the meteorite thing is a yeah, neat twist on that. The one part, the one weird like scientific flub, or at least I, I think it's a scientific flub he makes her, which is kind of surprising given how like closely he tries to match you know science. Um, mm. Is the whole. Uh, uh, when he was, you know, like trying to keep his hand from freezing because it was a thin glove or like when he shot them, you know, they kind of showed like, you know, the, he kind of like described um, like the droplets of blood or whatever and all that immediately like freezing mm-hmm. after, you know, he shoots them. And, you know, it's my understanding that like that's not how like things don't flash freeze in space, like despite it being, you know, technically, at least in the vacuum of deep space, technically, you know, a, a degree above zero Kelvin or something like that, because there's no. There's no medium there for heat to leach. Freezing is the transference of heat. Mm. And in space, there is no medium, or it's it's so thin um, that, like, you're not actually, like, like if you were exposed, your physical body was exposed to space, obviously decompression, and if you weren't shielded from radiation or something like that, you'd get radiation breeze, but you're not actually, like, in, da- in immediate danger of, like, freezing to death. Because like there's nowhere for the heat of your body to go, so like things don't freeze like that. Um, hmm, interesting. I didn't. I didn't know that. I, I. I guess like I always assumed like yeah, space is cold. You're gonna freeze. <laughs> but I did. Right. I, yeah. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. Like I remember this from. Um, well, I remember reading this. Uh, you know, this was a this. Uh, this was like a, from an article like uh, breaking down. If you ever seen the movie Sunshine, um, it was like the danny boyle movie about um is from like 2007 or 2008 it's a good movie it's a good space movie otherwise but uh you know it's about um like the sun is waning and humans are you know uh like sent you know send a uh a ship essentially with a gigantic nuclear payload to like restart the sun but it's Mm. kind of about that journey and all but you know it goes it's a lot a lot of expanse style you know like uh you know space travel stuff it's pretty it's a pretty good movie but there is this one scene where you know they kind of have to do like a without suits you know like a couple characters have to like you know p- propel themselves through de- space to uh you know from like one airlock to another or something like that and they're like wrapping themselves in like like thermal like uh insulation or something like that to keep themselves from freezing and they still show like one character by the time they get to there with like you know frostbitten hands and stuff like that and you know there was like a you know, I was reading an article just, you know, debunking that, saying that you don't really like flash freeze in space like that because, you know, mm. again, there's no there's no medium for heat to transfer out of your body. You would actually freeze faster, you know, freeze to death faster in you know, cold water, you know, forty degree water than you would in space. Mm, interesting. Yeah. The the one thing I was thinking was, was strange was like when they talk about him shooting the bullet or the meteorite from five kilometers away, like. It wouldn't go straight, right? It would kind of curve along with with you know with, with everything else, right? Because like they're constantly like in motion, right? That like they're in orbit around the around the Earth, and so like everything's like constantly going in a circle. So like they're not just like standing still. So I, well, I would assume no, that could I mean, be. Well, I mean, if you shot, well, no, I mean, if you shot, I mean, I don't know how Earth's gravity would affect, but no, I mean, there, if he's stabilized with you know regards to them, and he's like, I guess moving at the same speed you know in orbit around the earth no i mean if if there was no other interference if you were aiming at them because you know the bullets would come out of the gun moving at the same lateral movement you know you know with regards yeah. to the earth as he was as they were so uh, yeah, it just I mean, like as that, long it... as he was like stable and not like i don't know i guess you know i mean i guess that's the hard part you know like i guess if he was still like moving in relation to them you know in their position like accelerating in some vector then yeah maybe but yeah i don't know it just seemed like it should be more complicated than just like shooting in a straight line (laughs) but well yeah i mean i guess that's that's the point like things get you know when it comes to stuff like that things get less complicated in space than they mm -hmm. do on you know earth with air and gravity and yeah true resistance thank you for listening Please check out rehydrate.space for release episodes, reading lists, pronunciation guides, and all the information about the, the podcast. Um, please feel free to leave us comments or by emailing us at rehydrate at fastmail.com or on Twitter at rehydratepod. 
And if you feel so inclined, please feel free to leave a rating on any system that you listen to the podcast on. Like I said, if you have more insight into any of the concepts we talk about, you know, feel free to send it to us and we'll, we'll look at it and probably even read it. Uh, so please join us next time for episode four, Natural Selection. We'll be covering the first third of part three of The Dark Forest by Lucy Shin.